to those who are virtually connected. Uh, I am delighted to welcome everyone to the fourth day of the I Humanities College Summer School of Literary Theory and Philosophy 2021, which is a joint initiative between University of Wales, Trinity St. David and St. Bergman's College, Kerala. Uh, today we have Scott Slovic with us. Um, he is the University Distinguished Professor of Environmental Humanities at the University of Idaho. Um, it is very difficult to summarize his contribution in a few minutes. He is a scholar for excellence, having um, more than 200, having published more than 200 articles in the field of ego criticism and written, edited, and co edited 21 books and counting. Uh, yeah, we are delighted to hear about contemplating eco precarity during the corona virus pandemic, the convergence of the medical humanities and eco criticism from you, Scott. Thank you for this opportunity, and now it's over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nathan, and also thanks to Rebecca and others involved in in uh, coordinating this summer school program. Um, I'd like to try to share my screen now um, so I can put up a few PowerPoint slides uh, during my presentation. So let me attempt to do that at this time. Uh, OK, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. So yes, good. That's Let me right. that good, good. Okay, uh, great. Uh, well, thanks again to everyone who's been involved in uh, organizing this series of, of presentations. Um, it's really a, a pleasure for me to have the chance to share some ideas with you about the environmental humanities and more specifically environmental literary studies or eco criticism as part of this series of presentations and conversations uh, you'll all be participating in this summer. I'm speaking to you today from Sun River, Oregon, a small village near the city of Bend, Oregon in the Western United States, where it's now around nine o'clock in the evening. I've been alternating my time between Sun River and Eugene since uh, March of 2020, when I began teaching remotely at the University of Idaho, about 700 kilometers away from here uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so many aspects of our lives changed dramatically in 2020, didn't they? Our constant use of Zoom and other communications platforms is just one of the ways we've adjusted to the challenges of COVID-19. I've been asked on many occasions in the past year to consider how certain ideas from the environmental humanities may provide insight into our pandemic experience. And I wanted to share some of these ideas with you today, especially focusing on certain concepts related to precarity, um, which I take a term that I take from Professor Pramod K. Nayar, uh, who's based at Hyderabad University in India. Just in case it's not obvious, how precarity or extreme vulnerability is relevant to the pandemic. I'll explain this concept in depth in a few minutes. The cover image on my, or the image on my cover slide, my first slide, in fact, is one that shows my longtime colleague, Professor Cheryl Glotfelty, a founding scholar in the field of eco criticism who retired a few years ago from the University of Nevada, Reno, and now spends much of her time slack lining and high lining, doing what she loves to do these days. Um, it, this seems like a quite a precarious way to spend one's retirement, don't you think? Uh, here she is walking across a narrow piece of nylon webbing strung over a deep canyon in California with a river far below. Anyway, I thought I would begin my talk by saying a few general words about the environmental humanities and then I'll introduce some of the powerful and popular concepts in the field, which are connected to the readings that I believe have been made available to you for my lecture. Also, at the end of my talk, I'll discuss one of my current projects, which I'm working on with Professor Swanalata Rangaranjan from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and Professor Vidya Sarvesaran from IIT Jodhpur involving the convergence between the medical humanities and the environmental humanities. This new handbook, which we're preparing for the UK-based publisher Bloomsbury, is also highly relevant to our lives during the pandemic. Uh, 
I believe the readings you received for today's talk include my own overview of the environmental humanities for the website arithmeticofcompassion.org. Let me see if I, my slides are advancing just a second. Um, okay. Um, the, the, uh, my, my overview of the environmental humanities, uh, the introduction from Rob Nixon's influential 2011 book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, Stacia Lemo's important 2008 article, Transcorporeal Feminisms and the Ethical Space of Nature, in which she introduces the term transcorporeality, and a few sections from Professor Nayar's 2017 book on precarity titled Bhopal's Ecological Gothic, uh, the first of his two recent books on this subject. The website www.arithmeticofcompassion.org emerged in 2015 from the book my father, psychologist Paul Slovic, and I published that year titled Numbers and Nerves, Information, Emotion, and Meaning in a World of Data. Much of that book and the subsequent website focuses on certain psychological challenges that human beings experience as we try to process information about important ecological and humanitarian challenges, including psychic numbing and pseudo inefficacy. The human mind is highly sensitive to small scale phenomena, such as the predicament of a, a single human being or a single animal who is facing some kind of danger but we are surprisingly, perhaps even tragically, ill-suited to appreciating the significance or the meaning of large-scale phenomena, such as poverty, malnutrition, the spread of disease, genocide, mass casualty catastrophes, such as the Bhopal chemical disaster from 1984, uh, air and water pollution, plastic pollution of the world's oceans, mass extinction, and global climate change, to mention just a few. This website seeks to show the relevance of cognitive psychology and the environmental humanities to the world's major challenges. The short essay I've given you as a printout for today's talk aims to summarize a few key ideas from the environmental humanities that seem relevant to what my father and I call the arithmetic of compassion. And this is a phrase, arithmetic of compassion, that actually comes from a poem uh, titled, Mr. Cogito Reads the Newspaper from the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, uh, which was originally published in the early 1970s. Um, uh, and, and the final line of the poem is the arithmetic of, arithmetic of compassion. And this, as we interpret that phrase, it means the way the human mind struggles to compute the emotional meaning of various phenomena we experience in our lives. As I say in my article, the environmental humanities are a connected set of disciplines such as eco-criticism, environmental history, environmental philosophy, and environmental religious studies that offer powerful tools for understanding and responding to some of the greatest challenges we face in the world today. Nearly three decades ago, environmental historian Donald Worster stated that we are facing a global crisis today, not because of how ecosystems function, but rather because of how our ethical, our human ethical systems function. Getting through the crisis, he writes, requires understanding our impact on nature as precisely as possible, which is what the natural sciences can help us do. But even more, he writes, it requires understanding those ethical systems and using that understanding to reform them, end quote. During the past several decades, scholars in the environmental humanities have developed a variety of vocabularies, methodologies, and critical lenses, ranging from environmental justice and post-colonial eco-critical textual studies to biosemiotics, post-humanism, critical animal studies, new materialist philosophy, and concepts related to information management often absorbing strategies from other academic fields. In my brief overview of the environmental humanities in this piece that I wrote for the website a few years ago, I've highlighted several of the ideas and approaches 
that I find especially exciting, including Nixon's ideas about slow violence, certain concepts related to the importance of storytelling as a way of breaking through the psychic numbing that often occurs when people try to appreciate the meaning of large, slow, faraway phenomena. In particular, I write about Suzanne Keen's notion of narrative empathy. And I've also included a section on the very new approach in environmental literary studies known as empirical ecocriticism, which involves using experimental techniques from the social sciences as a way of determining the psychological effects of exposure to certain kinds of cultural texts from literature to film, which influence how people think and act with regard to the non-human world. The website www.empiricalecocriticism.com provides detailed information about this emerging approach. At this point, let me turn to say a few words about the readings I've given you from Rob Nixon and Stacey Alemo. Having looked at these pieces, I think you'll be in good shape to jump right into reading more recent ecocritical work that tends to use such concepts as slow violence and or transcorporeality. These terms are pretty widely used throughout the environmental humanities. So you'll immediately be clued into some of that vocabulary if you read these uh, handouts for, for this lecture. Um, these are almost ubiquitous concepts in the field at this point. Let's start with Nixon's slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor. I think it will be pretty obvious, even to those of you who may not have heard the concept slow violence before, how relevant this idea is to the kinds of phenomena that are happening in our lives and throughout the world. I have time to say only a few brief things about the book in today's talk, but in a regular class, I'd spend at least a week, multiple seminar sessions, discussing the introduction and specific chapters with my graduate students. If there are aspects of this work that I don't mention in my talk, and you'd like to bring up during the Q&A, please feel free to do so. Nixon does an especially good job of defining the concept of slow violence in the introduction. He writes on page two that by slow violence, I mean, he means a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. Violence is customarily conceived as an event or action that is immediate in time, explosive and spectacular in space, and as erupting into instant sensational visibility. He continues uh, writing, we need, I believe, to engage a different kind of violence, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive. Its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. The kinds of phenomena he alludes to in this passage and throughout his book occur so gradually and on such imperceptible scales, both extraordinarily large and micro microscopically small, that they stretch the very meaning of the word violence. Many of these destructive processes that might better be described as structural violence, as he states later in the chapter on page 10. Um, they are processes uh, deeply embedded in the fabric of society and in the physical world, so familiar that we've become complacent toward them, so ever present that we no longer take notice. Indeed, I believe that one of the major contributions of Nixon's work is the way he highlights slow violence as a perceptual and cognitive problem, not only a type of challenge that exists in the external world. The way our own physical senses and our minds fail to perceive this kind of violence is of special importance. He writes on page 14, how do we bring home and bring emotionally to life threats that take time to wreak their havoc, threats that never materialize in one spectacular, explosive, cinematic scene? Apprehension is a critical word here, a crossover term that draws together the domains of perception, emotion, and action. 
To engage slow violence is to confront layered predicaments of apprehension, to apprehend, to arrest, or at least mitigate often imperceptible threats requires rendering them apprehensible to the senses through the works of scientific and imaginative testimony." End quote. Again, the word Nixon uses here to describe the challenge of registering slow violence as it occurs in the world is apprehension. Literally, the process of grabbing a hold of these vast and imperceptible phenomena with our senses and our minds. In this same introduction, Nixon points to a category of literary artists and journalists whom he calls writer activists. See page 15 uh, in the handout. Uh, he points to them as kind, the kinds of people who might help the public do a better job of apprehending and responding to slow violence in the world. When I teach the environmental humanities, I also suggest to my students that scholars can play a role in this as well as, as um, scholar activists, using our voices not only to speak to the choir and write for small specialized audiences in technical journals, but also sharing ideas, our ideas, in public forums such as newspapers and the internet speaking at public meetings and writing letters to corporate and government officials. In my graduate seminars these days, I not only ask my students to write traditional academic studies, but to prepare op-eds and press releases based on their research that can be shared with broader audiences. But this is a bit of a digression from my focus in this talk. And if you're interested in the idea of going public as scholars, I'd be happy to talk about that as well during the Q&A. Let me now say a bit about Stacia Lemos' notion of transcorporeality, which she first articulated in the 2008 article I shared with you for today, but then out elaborated on in her 2010 book, uh, bodily natures, science, environment, and the material self. In a way, I think Alemo's idea that the human body is constantly in contact with the external material world, taking material substances into our bodies and sending physical matter back out into the world, even through our very breath, fits very well with Nixon's notion of slow violence because the effects of our transcorporeal relationship with the world often have a very slow but significant effect on our own health and on public health more generally. I won't read the passage on this slide right now, but I would be happy to address any questions you have in response to Alemo's essay during our Q&A period. An article that I published in the European Journal of Ecocriticism, Ecozona, in 2020, titled Cultivating an Ability to Imagine, is an example of how ecocritics can use slow violence and transcorporeality together to address the way certain types of discourse, certain types of language or expression can raise public awareness of environmental contamination. My focus in that article is on what I call the poetics of toxicity, which means literally poetry about environments that have been made toxic due to mining activities. Soon after people around the world began changing their lives in reaction to the pandemic around a year and a half ago, I started to think in particular about the psychological responses I had observed through the media and in my own life. In some of my previous lectures about the pandemic, I've listed several examples of what I call COVID mind, by which I mean ways of thinking inspired by the COVID crisis that might actually be beneficial to our ongoing survival as a species enabling us to adapt to this world of worries and uncertainties. Specifically, I suggested that these psychological or cognitive tendencies might include the following. One, and these are listed up on the slide, a growing sense of universal vulnerability. Two, a heightened awareness of the human mind's insensitivity to exponential and potentially catastrophic change. Three, 
a growing awareness that our interactions with the animal world have genuine consequences for human beings, as in the case of zoonotic transmission of disease. And four, an appreciation of what it means to put on the socio-cultural breaks to come to a halt in various aspects of our daily experience and change the way we live, our interactions with other people, the way we do our work, our experience of travel and so forth. Again, uh, these these four ideas are aspects of the psychology of the pandemic that I've been writing and lecturing about in the past year. In today's talk, I want to focus on the specific idea of a universal sense of vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the COVID pandemic, which I've called eco-precarity in the title of my talk today, using the term developed by Pramod K. Nayar from Hyderabad. I'm interested in highlighting the strangely paradoxical psychological dimension of the pandemic, <clears throat> um, at least in my own experience, describing the paradox as one where I seem to be living my life these days in a dissonant context, condition of normalcy and peril. I know there are a lot of dangerous things out in the world. In fact, there's been a kind of implicit danger until very recently, even in standing too close to my neighbors, especially if they're not wearing masks and possibly sharing specks of contaminated bodily fluids merely by speaking to friends and family members. To think this way is really strange, isn't it? And yet it's become the new normal for all of us. Eco-precarity is the idea accentuated by certain kinds of cultural texts that we live in a world where human beings and other living organisms are vulnerable to various threats. As Professor Nayar puts it, precariousness, and this is on the slide, is the effect of an exposure to the world which then inflicts injury. That's his basic definition of precariousness or precarity. And eco-precarity, a concept he developed further in his 2019 book on this subject, emphasizes the idea that our own vulnerability may be caused by threats from the natural environment, and the idea that the, the environment itself may be vulnerable to various threats, inclu including threats caused by human beings. When the pandemic descended upon us in February of 2020, thereabouts, earlier or later, we had just begun a new academic term at the University of Idaho, where I teach. I was offering two classes at the time, an undergraduate writing class and a graduate seminar on the environmental humanities. We began the term meeting face to face, but in March 2020, we shifted all classes to a virtual format, most of us teaching over Zoom. The past academic year uh, occurred almost entirely in remote formats at my university. What I'm saying is that for more than a year now, I have not seen any of my students in person, only over Zoom. When I first wrote about the strange psychological balance between normalcy and peril that many of us are experiencing during the pandemic, in April of last year, we had only a few thousand known COVID deaths in the United States. When I gave a talk about pandemic psychology in August 2020, the Centers for Disease Control said we had experienced more than 181,000 deaths in the United States. In March of this year, when I gave another such lecture, we had surpassed 530,000 deaths from COVID in this country. And as of today, four months later, we have exceeded 600,000 deaths in the United States alone, with more than 4 million deaths worldwide. And if, if we had time to elaborate on this, I would talk about the, the perception of this, these numbers of, of uh, casualties of COVID in terms of psychic numbing and how, how minute a psychological or emotional difference there is between these numbers from 181,000 to 530,000 to 600,000 to 4 million. They're, they're, it's very difficult to really be sensitive to the significance of these increasing and um, catastrophic numbers of casualties due to the pandemic. One of the strange surprises for me during the pandemic, as I hinted at 
a, a moment ago, is that there's a kind of normalcy to our lives, even in the midst of the COVID crisis, despite the tremendous suffering and loss of life. However, I also find myself thinking about the peril of our species in a more acute and visceral way than was previously the case, even though I know the world is fraught with risk and danger, with uncertainty. It seems to me that we should carry away from the current moment the powerful idea that so-called normalcy and so-called peril coexist paradoxically in uneasy tension. Today's mindset should, I think, be part of what I call COVID mind, a way of thinking that helps us to be sensitive to the serious threats we and others are facing in the world, even if we do not feel ourselves to be in immediate danger of suffering death or loss in a given moment. To me, normalcy enables us to conduct our daily lives with a certain effectiveness, but peril should keep us on our toes, vigilant and concerned. We are all vulnerable. I tried to describe this, this uh, paradoxical relationship between normalcy and peril in an article I wrote about COVID mind for the Swedish website bifrostonline.org, which published a special group of articles last year titled The New Normal in Environmental Humanities Perspective. Some of the best thinking I've encountered on the subject of vulnerability is the work of Professor Nayar, which I mentioned earlier. Pramod Nayar has published two recent books on different aspects of precarity from both social justice and environmental perspectives. These are the 2017 book, Bhopal's Ecological Gothic, Disaster, Precarity, and the Biopolitical Uncanny, and the 2019 publication, Eco Precarity, Vulnerable Lives in Literature and Culture. The earlier book about Bhopal argues that the terrible Union Carbide chemical accident of 1984 has continued to haunt society for more than 30 years, characterizing Bhopali lives and stimulating public concern about the dangers of industrial society and the frequently unethical practices of multinational corporations in externalizing the risks and costs of their activities. Nayar focuses in particular on the Gothic quality of the art and literature that have emerged from the 1984 disaster, a quality that results in a kind of unsettling psychological affect, a feeling of disquiet. This is a good thing, as I understand it, the way disaster texts, such as the tradition of Bhopal related work, enables us, um, enable us to be concerned about an event that occurred long ago to people far away and enables us uh, potentially to exert our voices, our economic actions and our votes to prevent future such occurrences. The cultural representation of vulnerable Bhopali lives helps to create enhanced public awareness of an ongoing ecological and biopolitical threat. Nayar points to such artistic works as Indra Sinha's 2007 novel, Animals, People, as the chief examples of cultural texts that gothicize, that, that represent in a gothic uh, framework, the Bhopali experience, creating an uncanny sensation for readers because the reality represented there is both familiar and strange. In a sense, this uncanniness may be what I'm trying to explain when I speak about the simultaneous sense of normalcy and peril that characterizes my personal experience of the COVID uh, pandemic so far. Nayar writes in Bhopal's Ecological Gothic that the Bhopal texts foreground a social ontology of the Bhopali, one that slides, and this is on the slide, obviously, slides from vulnerability to helplessness or a state of precariousness. It is an ecosystem and ecology wherein precarity is the order of the Bhopali day. The Bhopal Gothic in its discourse of injurability points less to the bodies of the victim than to the embedding of these bodies in specifically dangerous settings and environs haunted by a toxic past. <clears throat> 
that is, the Bhopal Gothic of toxic haunting, specters of destruction, secrecy, and repression is cathected or invested with emotional energy onto human bodies and the body politic, both of which are thereby rendered precarious. Precarious subjects, individuals, constitute the precariat public sphere in Bhopal, even 30 years after the disaster. Bhopal instantiates a precarious cultural condition in its texts from 1984 to the present. What Nayar seems to be emphasizing in this passage is the idea that the physical environment of one specific place in the world, Bhopal, India, has come to represent not only toxicity, but precarity itself. Cultural texts such as literature, film, and photography play a particular role in reinforcing the cultural function of Bhopal, reminding society of the specters of destruction created by certain kinds of industrial activity. There is also, of course, a social justice aspect to the Bhopal story, just as there is in the case of COVID-19. Nayar turns to theorist Judith Butler's 2004 book, Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning and Violence, to emphasize the fact that, quote, some lives are rendered more precarious, unlivable, and their deaths less grievable than others, end quote. I realize we're currently in the midst of the COVID pandemic. In fact, I learned just before the lecture tonight, um, it's, it's nighttime, my time, uh, that India has just entered a new lockdown phase as the, the pandemic uh, continues, even as in the Western United States, things seem to be opening up um, very gingerly and carefully. Um, and uh, I, I'm afraid that we may encounter a further surge of COVID cases here as well, but um, we are experiencing the pandemic variably in different places around the world right now, but it's not over. And yet, even in the heart of this experience, as our minds adjust to the new reality, there is a danger that we might become increasingly complacent and numb to the perils of the world, including the potential for even more expansive contagion. This is especially the case because we cannot see the danger around us. In fact, I think I may need to add impatient complacency to my list of psychological conditions emerging from the pandemic, as we see worrisome examples of anti-masking, large gatherings, and the premature opening of businesses and schools in the US and elsewhere, spurred partly because of the existence of several vaccines at this point, despite, and despite the fact that there are virulent and easily transmissible variants of the COVID virus that may not be blocked by any of the available vaccines. In fact, I read just before starting the lecture that um, the Pfizer Pharmaceutical Corporation is now um, arguing that they need to begin giving booster shots beyond the two doses of Pfizer vaccine that, that um, have been administered widely at this point. So we're not really not quite sure whether the vaccines are even potent enough to protect us effectively. Some of my own current research in, involves using techniques from the field of empirical ecocriticism to study how particular kinds of cultural texts, including pandemic novels, use narrative strategies to puncture complacency and promote in readers a sense of urgent precarity. I wonder whether cultural texts can, almost like booster shots of vaccine, can, can uh, re-intensify the feeling of precarity that will enable us, enable us to live more cautiously and mindfully with regard not only to the pandemic, but other kinds of uh, challenges that we face in society, including ecological ch uh, uh, challenges. The sheer invisibility of certain types of threats leads to insensitivity, and as Nayar describes it in the case of Bhopal, a kind of repression of knowledge and awareness. In the section of Bhopal's ecological Gothic titled Apprehension, Recognition, and the Repressed, Nayar points to the fact that a lot of information about the 1984 accident was, as he puts it, secreted away in files and communications controlled by Union Carbide of India Limited and government officials. 
Notice how Nayar, like Nixon, emphasizes apprehension as a key aspect of how the public conceptualizes public health threats. He refers to the idea of secret information and in ambiguous information as a kind of textual uncanny by which there is a societal repression of the information necessary for the public to remember and care about events like Bhopal. The alternative to repression is apprehension or the cognitive grasping of a phenomenon or an experience. Judith Butler writes that apprehension is, quote, a form of knowing bound up with sensing and perceiving, end quote. We face a similar predicament with regard to our efforts to grasp and appreciate the meaning of the current pandemic, as much of the experience of the pandemic is hidden away in hospitals, the data secreted in government databases that are minimally available to the public. I don't know how the situation in India or various other places, the UK and, and continental Europe where attendees of, of tonight's lecture are, um, but um, in the US, the government actively suppressed information um, during the previous administration in a rather appalling way that I've never been quite aware of previously. Um, firing or otherwise silencing government officials who tried to go public with information the administration deemed detrimental to reopening the economy. Much of what Nayar claims about the secrecy related to the Bhopal accident and the efforts of subsequent journalists, artists, and writers to reveal secret information felt eerily relevant to the experience we faced in the United States with regard to the pandemic before we had reg regime change approximately six months ago. I wanted to mention too, the compelling conclusion Nayar offers in his book, Bhopal's Ecological Gothic, analyzing the visual rhetoric of the image um, of uh, Raghu Rai's photograph titled Burial of an Unknown Child, which shows a hand brushing dirt and stones from the face of a small child whose body is otherwise covered. This is part of the Nayar reading that was given to you for today's talk. As we look ahead to future textual representations of the pandemic we're now living through, we might stay alert to the use of jarring visual and narrative rhetoric of this kind, in which the normalcy and peril of our present moment might be captured. Nayar describes the dissonant, uncanny pairing of decorum and the grotesque captured in Rai's photograph as follows. And this is on the screen for you. There is a certain tenderness with which the hand brushes mud and gravel around the child's face slash head. The tenderness standing as a, as a sharp contrast to the horrors of the 2nd and 3rd of December, 1984 is gut-wrenching because it also signals a delicacy, a propriety toward the dead child, which the child possibly never was never accorded uh, in the moments of dying. There is in the act captured in the photograph a fantasy or illusion of decorum, which Bhopal did not possess or exhibit in the course of the disaster, nor was it allowed the victims or survivors. However, in the bleached staring eyes of the dead child, the anonymity of identity sits oddly with the delicacy and propriety of the brushing hand. I suggest that what arrests us is this very conjunction of the delicate and proper with the grotesque. The image of the respected dignified body being treated with care is an odd reminder of the sheer grotesque nature of the deaths of Bhopal, everted or contorted physiologies, choking and coughing to death." End quote. By exploring the aesthetic, ethical, rhetorical, and psychological nuances of textual representations of vulnerability in the context of the 1984 industrial disaster in Bhopal, Pramod Nayar offers a blueprint for how we might begin to understand the current public health crisis that is not confined to a single city or region on the planet, unlike Bhopal, but is shared across continents and nations. The global dimension of the COVID pandemic is strikingly different than the Bhopal story, but in some ways 
even a seemingly place-focused industrial disaster is actually more widespread than it may seem at first glance, representative as it is of a broader risk posed by modern technology and global capitalism. Nayar was clearly thinking of the psychology and aesthetics of precarity in a much broader context than the Bhopal story alone when he was working on the 2017 volume as he shortly thereafter published the 2019 book, Eco Precarity, Vulnerable Lives in Literature and Culture, in which he argues that the precariat, as he puts it, those who experience precarity include not only the di uh, diverse human beings, but non-human subjects. He argues that ecological disaster and eco-apocalypse, along with the different states of eco-precarity are central to contemporary environmentality, the term Lawrence Buell used in 2005 to describe the modes of what Buell called the modes through which literary and cultural texts from cinema to fiction engage with ecological issues and concerns. The particular focus of the book Eco-Precarity is the contingent nature of the earth, what Nayar calls the beauty, fragility, this is what I have on the screen here, the beauty, fragility, and singularity of the planet we inhabit, which we stand to lose if we do not take care of our only home. So he expands from the single industrial disaster and its uh, cultural tradition to um, a broader consideration of what he calls eco-precarity. Uh, wait a second. Uh, in Eco Precarity, Nayar ventures into the territory of a project I'm currently working on with my colleagues, Swarnalata Rangaranjan and Vidya Sarveswaran, a handbook to medical environmental humanities that will include 28 chapters by scholars from throughout the world, attempting to understand various connections between human health and the external world and also exploring the health and vulnerability of the non-human realm from the perspective of illness, injury, and well-being. Just as Pramod Nayar was able easily to adapt his analysis of human precarity to the broader planetary context in moving from Bhopal's ecological Gothic to the more recent book, Eco Precarity, there have long been efforts to use the rubric of health and medicine to characterize human interactions with nature. When Swarna, Vidya, and I approached potential contributors to the Medical Environmental Humanities Handbook, we invited them to try to explore human and planetary health in ways that go beyond the loose symbolic idea of health in human and non-human contexts, using theories of disease, disrepair, treatment, recovery, and physical and mental well-being from various cultures around the world. Contributors are discussing the use of narrative medicine as a way of revealing the plight of victims of contaminated environments. Um, uh, and this includes the, um, uh, the case of uh, one particular city in the American state of Michigan that has uh, terrible um, uh, public water resources and all of the inhabitants, all of the residents are forced to use bottled water these days. Um, and this is studied in the context of narrative medicine. Yeah, and um, also linkages between mental illness and geographical displacement, the effort to bring medical advancements into the Amazon rainforest to support the health of indigenous tribes, tribes people, rather than removing sick people and treating them in Brazilian cities and thus disrupting their experience of place and community, among many other medical and environmental topics. Cultural lenses on the conjunctions between human health and the natural world, ranging from traditional Sufi folk music from Turkey to Ayurvedic philosophy from India um, are included in, in the book. One article explores the idea of human plant intercorporeality, which sounds like a play on the idea of transcorporeality that I was discussing earlier. Uh, in other words, intercorporeality, the merging of human and plant bodies in Australian Aboriginal poetry, while another considers the role of nature in traditional medicine as represented in the novels of Nigerian author Chinua Achebe. The central goal of, of the 
handbook project is to show how our ecological predicament, toxic land, water, and air, loss of species, diminishment of access to water and other resources needed for survival, and a changing climate that will fundamentally disrupt human life and many other life forms on the planet is a simultaneous threat to human health. The special challenge in this project, I think, is to go beyond superficial analogies between human health and planetary health, which abound in popular culture. And let me, um, as I work toward conclusion, point in a little bit more detail to a few of the examples of what people are studying for this uh, effort to bring together medical humanities and environmental humanities. Uh, Professor Jiaru Chang, um, who's a Taiwanese scholar, at, based at Brooklyn College in New York in the United States, has drafted an essay titled COVID-19, Mimetic Pathology and Solutions in a Time of Pan-Epidemic Anthropocene, which seeks to understand the current pandemic from a range of perspectives, not only the biophysical one. She writes, here we can see that COVID pathology encompasses a wide range of pathological or disease related conditions from biological infection from the virus and mental trauma to abnormal social behavior triggered by the pandemic. This chapter, her chapter, zooms in on the prevalent racist and xenophobic attacks during the COVID pandemic and frames them as an example of socio-ecological COVID pathology. As a self-defense and coping strategy, an individual or community tends to find something or somebody to blame, either as a divine cosmic plot, e.g. Satan's work, or more mundanely as a political conspiracy theory. One of the most dangerous ideological patholog pathologies is blaming and prompting hate crimes and violence against cultural and non-human others for the outbreak and mishandling of disease, end quote. Uh, again, as a Taiwanese scholar of Chinese culture living in the United States, Professor Chang is particularly sensitive to the anti-Chinese response in this country as a way of scapegoating people associated with the country where COVID-19 originated. She refers to this as a form of eco-fascism which is an aberrant and dangerous social pathology. Chang is also a specialist in critical animal studies, very sensitive to the relationships between humans and other species. So an important part of her study is also the section called Blaming the Animal Other, where she focuses on the zoonotic aspects of COVID, the fact that the disease may have been transferred to humans from another animal species. She writes, just as there is a reactionary game of blaming and stigmatizing infected or potentially infectious human bodies, so animals are not exempt from scapegoating. That is, whenever a zoonotic outbreak occurs, non-human animals are blamed as the cause, even before they're proven guilty, end quote. Professor Chong uses uh, René Girard's scapegoat theory, he's a a uh, scholar of French literature, I believe, but developed a, no a notion related to scapegoating in various cultural contexts. And uh, uh, Jaru Chang adapts Girard's theory of scapegoating to explain the social process by, with, by which individuals or groups within society are singled out for undeserved blame and treatment, representing this as a common uh, but dangerous uh, psychological pathology, one that many countries are experiencing at this very moment as a result of the pandemic. The environmental connections in this case result from the fact that the virus may well have originated um, with uh, bats or pangolins, um, which were immediately identified as the potential culprits, although to my knowledge that hasn't been finally determined. Professor Chang concludes her article with an extended analysis of what she calls a collective multicultural, multi species post humanist community, using post humanist theory from Rosie Bridati and others to suggest that we might use the pandemic as an opportun opportunity to learn how to coexist with the virus. She points as an example of this to a 2012 novel by Chinese writer and physician Bi Shumin titled Coronavirus, in which Bi calls for quote, respect 
for species place in the web of life and invokes a humility and awe vis-a-vis -vis the virus, end quote. So in the case of this particular study, the medical aspects involve not only the study of our responses to the current public health crisis, but a consideration of the broader pathology of blaming or scapegoating. The environmental aspect of Professor Tong's study centers on our attitudes toward other living beings, including possible carriers of the COVID virus. There are a few other chapters for the handbook that also seem directly relevant to the COVID pandemic, such as Turkish scholar Gizem Ilmaz Karahan's essay, Contagious History, The Imagination of Viruses, and French scholar Francoise Besson's Disseminating the Seeds of Words to Fight Spreading Diseases, from Albert Camus' La Peste to Tony Hillerman's The First Eagle. Also, we recently received a manuscript from another Taiwanese scholar, Catherine Yalan Chang, titled Reframing Care in the Age of a Novel Coronavirus, Food as Medicine on the Farms of Two Physician Farmers, in which the author argues that we can uh, see, link seemingly unrelated health, contemporary health crises, such as COVID-19 and diabetes, by contemplating our increasingly broken and unhealthy global food system, as she puts it. As I near the end of today's talk, I also wanted to mention a project I just learned about recently that's being conducted by English faculty members at Arizona State University. This work is based on a 2014 white paper titled The Necessity and I indicated here on the slide, the necessity of narrative linking literature and healthcare in higher education. This work, which involves the use of the healing power of words to help relieve the stress of frontline health workers during the pandemic, is not necessarily linked to the environmental humanities, but the particular example featured on the ASU website is a reading of William Butler Yeats's poem, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, by environmental humanities scholar Sir Jonathan Bate, who recently moved to ASU from Oxford University. Rather than cataloging the many other articles that will be part of the forthcoming book on the environmental humanities, I'd like at this point to stop talking and after a brief break, hear some questions and comments from anyone who's been listening to this talk. What I've tried to suggest is that in various ways, the COVID pandemic and various other crises we're experiencing have led to a broad sense of vulnerability or precarity that all of us are experiencing nowadays nowadays to some degree, although certainly some people are much more vulnerable than others. I've also tried to probe a little bit the strange, even paradoxical combination of normalcy and peril that we're experiencing as we accustom ourselves to the new normal of the risky pandemic world. And I've attempted to sketch out, at least briefly, the possibility of bringing together an interest in human physical and mental health and our environmental concerns. This latter approach uh, uh, seems to be a, a valuable uh, new angle in interdisciplinary humanities research and maybe one of the ways the humanities can contribute something meaningful during, the time, during a time of planetary crisis. Thanks very much. By the way, this is another image of, of eco-critic Cheryl Glotfelty highlining. This, this is in a, at a place called Taft Point in Yosemite National Park, a particularly awesome picture. And I, I was told by her afterwards, uh, uh, even though she loves highlining a, a terrifying experience of vulnerability, uh, she's actually, she's attached to the line that she's crossing. She has a, a safety harness around her. Still, you can imagine how, how um, uh, panicky one would feel in that kind of situation. So it's a, a final image of, of uh, uh, the experience of risk during our pandemic world. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you very much for your scholarly lecture and introducing the projects you, uh, in which you are involved. Yeah, uh, for the participants, um, your questions are welcome in the Zoom chat box. During the comfort break, post your questions in the chat box. Um, we will post the feedback form once we have collected all the questions from the chat box. Therefore, we ask you to refrain from posting 
uh, any messages about the feedback form. Um, thank you for your patience and we will meet in 15 minutes for the Q&A session. Thank you.